all for being here tonight. Uh, I have to say that Al Taylor and Mary Reed, Mary or someplace there, I'm sure, uh, were both right. They told me that everyone they know is coming to this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> They're all pretty much, which is great. My name is Tim Irvin. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of the Alliance for Economic Success, which is a nonprofit organization involved in economic development and community development uh, in Manistee County. And also with me here tonight is Betsy Evans. And uh, Betsy also is with the Alliance for Economic Success, and her primary focus is on business development, expansion, and attraction. I want to uh, make sure that we're clear tonight about what this meeting is about and, and who's hosting it. We are the hosts. We are a nonprofit organization. So this is not a meeting that is being held by a governmental agency. I know there are some questions about, about that today, so I want to be clear about that. Um, the purpose, the primary purpose of tonight is obviously to share information about um, a matter that all of you care deeply about, and that is the future of Portage Point Inn. And um, tonight we're, we're very thankful to have Bob Gazan over here, um, the owner of the inn uh, with us. And the, Bob will be reviewing um, his site plan, but really his plan for the business. And um, we're in a sense serving in two capacities here tonight. One is to enable Bob to communicate that plan to all of you and to others, um, because we are taping tonight, and I'll have Al Taylor explain that in a second, uh, but also to enable everyone here, and frankly those who couldn't make it with, make it here tonight, to learn about the plans for the end, um, to express your questions, your ideas. I know that Bob is always interested in, in creative solutions, um, and he'll, I'm sure, encourage that. But this is something that a lot of people care about for a whole lot of reasons. It's been around for a long time. And so it is great to have this kind of turnout and this kind of interest uh, in the future of Portage Point Inn. Um, I also want to say that because we have such a large turnout, we do have a few ground rules that are pretty straightforward. Um, again, tonight is about information, questions, and ideas. Um, again, because we have such a large, or a large group, uh, we will have just one person speaking at a time and maintain order in that way. Um, we will not get to all the questions, probably, tonight, and this is intended to be an hour and a half session. Um, but for those of you who have questions that are not answered tonight, or as you leave here and you thought, you know, I now that I think of it, I've got a question about this, or I've got an idea that I'd like to offer, um, please send those to the Alliance for Economic Success, and Betsy will put up a phone number here as well, but this is the email address, and we're gonna encourage anybody and everybody to send any questions, ideas, comments that you have through the end of the week. And if they aren't answered tonight, we will be taking all those questions and getting with Bob and answering them. And then through onekama.info, um, we'll be uh, posting the answer to any and all questions uh, that you have working um, directly with Bob. The way we want to, um, and then Al, I'll ask you to talk a little bit about the outreach component here. The way tonight is intended to work is that Bob Gazan will begin with a presentation of the site plan. And we would ask that you hold your questions, but there's, there's pencils and cards on each table. And we would encourage you to use those to jot down any questions that you have. And then following Bob's presentation, we're going to go around the room as many times as we can. And again, recognize the size of the crowd, there's some limits. But we'd like each table to just pick somebody um, to ask a question. And after Bob completes his presentation, we're going to give you a few minutes to talk at each table about the questions that you have and develop some consensus around one or two really big questions that you would like to talk about tonight. And so that's the way we're gonna to handle tonight. And again, we will we will have answers to all of the questions that are posed. Betsy? Did you mention, if everybody signed in, if you leave uh, an email address, uh, we can send out uh, questions and answers and any any questions that don't get answered tonight will make sure get answered. So if you leave an email, that way we can communicate all the information out. 
Yeah, and if, if you, for some reason, don't do any of the above, email or call that phone number as follow-up if you have questions or again any of your, your questions or comments. So, before we get started with Bob, David Meister, where are you? Are you? Right there. Um, there's one development that is somewhat related to tonight, and we thought it was timely to ask David to speak to that. Related but not related to this project right now, because um, Bob's project is operating, the porch point in for all of you, is operating under a special use permit currently. It is active, and he can open and run, and he can run with the existing septic that is there, according to the DE. So if anyone asks that question, it's not running illegally, it's not operating illegally, he doesn't need the sewer. When we entered into this morning, the township board hired Wade Trim as a consultant to come up with hard figures for doing a sewer around the lake, both sides. And that information is going to be put together and hopefully available by July. We plan on having a couple of information hearings when most of the summer people are here. We'll have hard facts and figures to go along with either three options are hooking to the village, the existing village sewer system, hooking to Little River Band of Ottawa Indians sewer system, or putting in our own system. And that's the three approaches that the consultant is going to look into and give us facts and figures. And I'll be able to present them at a board meeting, probably an open meeting actually. We'll probably have an information meeting sometime in July. It'll be well posted and well advertised. And I just want everyone to know that's what we did today. So that process is ongoing. Separate from this, because he can operate, but, but we thought the timing was right, and we're going to try it and we'll see what everybody thinks. That's on the property owner. And Dan, if anybody has any questions and wants to make sure they get information about that project, they can email or contact you or anybody at the township hall. <coughs> you know, it, it'll be well advertised. I mean, we post it, you check our website, it'll be updated on there. <coughs> Basically, when information comes out, the contract, I think, is on there today. We posted the uh, agreement that we signed yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. So that'll be on there in a couple days, the contract we signed with Wade Trim. And uh, I guess that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, David. And uh, one more. Um, Al, I'd like to turn to you. And uh, uh, thank you both to Al Taylor and to the Portage Lake Association. Um, you know, one thing that's good about these kinds of sessions is you share information and you share the facts. And that is really important to this project, important to the sewer project. These are very large, meaningful projects for this community. So, Al, maybe you could talk a little bit about what we're doing in terms of, of recording and what our follow-up plans are. In the spirit of trying to communicate to as many people in our community as possible, which includes the community that lives here, Full time, the community lives here part time, and the community just comes here some of the time and visits us. Uh, so, our webmaster, MS Creative Services on the is videotaping this uh, event. It'll be on YouTube tomorrow, I think. Uh, it'll be on the website, and then you can go from our website to YouTube to see it. The reason for YouTube is we don't have the bandwidth limit on YouTube that we have on our website, we don't want to bog it down. Uh, so, uh, there will also be the question and answers, the FAQs will be on there, the ones that we have tonight that are captured, and any ones that are, get sent in. So those will all be on www.onekama.info. Um, okay, and before we turn to Bob, one last thing, and that is once Bob, again, is, is wrapped up his presentation, we're going to give everybody a few minutes each table to kind of organize your questions. And then we're going to go around the table. Betsy is going to be recording your questions. And so that everybody can hear them, we'll be restating each question as, as they come. So with that, it's a pleasure to introduce the owner of 40 Point Inn with his plan for the site as well as the business population.
And there are some details that need to be straightened out before it's turned into any kind of match or site plans to get into the college at the same um, You were talking about sewer just a minute ago, and I wanted to quickly mention that the existing systems that we have are current code, but both the commercial and the residential codes will be being uh, changed in the fairly near future. And it's something that we all need to be aware of because uh, a lot of the infrastructure for our watershed, and specifically within a certain proximity to the, to the, to the Port of Lake or by water, will be directly affected by the new ordinances because um, from just a simple hydraulic standpoint, if you look at the way this topography is configured around the Portage Lake, we have a giant rolling pin that is forcing the hydraulics into the natural resource. That's the very reason why we're all here. So I, I feel foundationally that the infrastructure is where you start to build a project that you want to be a long-term asset. And um, the sewer system, in my opinion, is, is just incredibly important. Not to just, not to just this resort, but to our watershed, to this lake, and to, to the amenity that we all come with. So it, uh, it's really important, in my opinion, to, to deal with it now. And in my opinion, we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to, to do something that uh, we won't likely see again. So I'll leave that alone at this point, but uh, I've spent about two years getting to know the community, getting to know you folks, and uh, studying the property. I don't know if you know a whole lot about how I came to be involved, and I'll make it brief, but I don't do this for a living. I'm not a full-time developer. I'm an environmental dredging contractor. I did some work here, uh, ended up becoming a involuntary investor, I guess, and as a result, it led to to owning the place. Uh, so, I am, I have been and continue to be a fairly uh, open-minded to approaches. And that's one of the reasons I was hoping to have a community planning and improvement meeting with you folks, because I've learned a lot over this two-year period from suggestions, ideas, and, and input from the community. Uh, this project is absolutely the simplest development in the world for six to ten weeks a year. You could pretty much just put a tent up and it would work. This is a six to ten week uh, project that you would literally have to, you know, stumble over yourself to, 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 to screw up. The difficulty is that in, with this type of infrastructure and the holding costs and the need for capital reinvestment, you cannot survive on a six to 10 week season. Will, I, I've crunched the numbers every which way. I've, I've met with a dozen restaurateurs that are high-end restaurateurs, hoteliers from huge operations to mom and pop operations, and they all say the same thing. They're not willing to put the infrastructure costs in because the holding costs are just too great on a six to 10 week season. So what I'm asking for your help with is how do we build the shoulder seat? How do we bring in revenue to this property and to this community, quite frankly, that will allow these businesses, allow us to attract really successful, sustainable investors? The people that we need to be involved in this um, need to know that they have the demographic that's going to make them viable for more than six to ten weeks. And that is the challenge. Um, I have come up with this plan, and it probably comes a lot from my background. As I mentioned, I'm a marine contractor. I know the marine industry really well. I know what what the ins and outs are of that business, both from a uh, permitting and design standpoint, as well as an operation. I've, been, I've owned and do own uh, marinas, waterfront properties. And so I think that's what I bring to this project and to this community, is a real understanding of heavy construction, infrastructure, and marine uh, relationship. And what does Portage, Lake have, Portage Point Inn rather have to offer? 
We don't have a ski resort. We don't have slopes. We do not have a golf course. What we have is a connection to the water. This property exists because back in 1903, the steamships had this unique ability to come into a deep water, lay up along a deep water harbor, uh, shoreline rather, which is fairly rare, on a narrow peninsula where their guests could go to Lake Michigan beaches, to this, have access obviously to the inland lake and a safe harborage right inside the channel. That's its hook. And to me, that's the key to, to basically building the revenue stream for this place. So, what we have right now is an existing marina of 30 slips over here and two floating docks that provide an additional uh, 18 slips. So it's a total of 48 slips. The commercial boat traffic is already occupying the entire front. And my uh, suggestion and design calls for a concentration of commercial boat traffic that would actually protect people who want to swim or uh, go on to non-motorized vessels. So one of the things I wanted to point out is this floating dock that is currently there now would be uh, limited to non-motorized vessels. Originally, when I drew this, I drew it with an old-fashioned swim dock that you used to swim out to and you'd have, you know, lounge chairs or the ladder kids would come up and dive off it, trying to get back to a little bit of the historical connection that we had with this resort. And some of the uh, owners of the condos and people in the community said, why don't you just leave this floating dock here so I can walk out there with my kayak, my paddleboard, and get direct access to the water, but limit it so that there aren't motorized vehicle, uh, vessels coming in here. Right now, this property sees uh, commercial you know, vessels coming in and radiusing into the existing slips here, radiusing into the finger docks that are just exactly parallel to this floating dock here, and as well as obviously coming into this system here. So you literally have boat traffic navigating the entire frontage. At the same time, you can have, you're not supposed to, I've got signs up, just so you know you're not supposed to swim where there are commercial vessels moving back and forth. But they do, and it's dangerous. It's not protecting the swimmers. Because someone from this condo over here, Mr. Jones' kids could be running out to go water skiing, and Mr. Smith's kids are happen to be swimming and diving off the docks. They don't see each other. They back out. They run. They run someone over. That is a uh, significant risk when you have. This is, by the way, just to clarify, this is a commercial uh, boat traffic area. In front of a cottage, you can put one dock out. You can have up to five small vessels on that dock, and you historically you'll see the kids from that family diving off the docks when they're on the boats. Fairly common. My analogy for that is oftentimes you'll let your kids play with sidewalk chalk in your driveway. Because when you back out of the garage, you carefully, you know who your kids are, you know they're there, you will, you know, how you look for them. But you wouldn't check into a hotel, hand your kids a box of sidewalk chalk and say, hey, why don't you go play in the parking garage? Because there are people who don't know your kids coming and going through that. And this is exactly what you have here. This is a commercial... Uh, marina operation, not residential. Therefore, we need to isolate it. So, again, back to this area over here, the idea would be this is the swimming beach, this is a protected swim area, and these would be for only non-motorized vessels. Then, if you look at the way the boat traffic has to come in, they all have to come in through this pierhead. The idea is to bring back uh, what I call a commercial pierhead, and hopefully develop a water taxi and water transit system. Um, we are hoping that our liquor license will allow us to also have watercraft, uh, be able to serve on watercraft, which I think is a pretty unique amenity to bring to the, the facility. We, we hope to have old-fashioned launches, the old historical launches that have 40 people you could have a small bar set up on there. You can take people on sunset cruises. If Lake Michigan is calm, they can go out 
watch the sunset. If it's this rough, you tour around the lake and you, you watch the sunset at the mouth of the channel. I'm sure you're fairly familiar with that. Um, but a unique opportunity to not just have the guests of this property, but if you could create docking terminals around the lake to invite people to come to town, not use the roads, reduce vehicular traffic, and uh, really experience all of it. So, uh, that's the purpose of this pier head. The other big benefit, in, as I mentioned, is that all the traffic is contained and controlled in this area, so that if you don't have the potential for providing service. Uh, let's see. If you look closely, you'll see that uh, the cross hatching on some of these buildings, these are areas to be either additions or renovations of existing structures. And the biggest area of renovation is probably, well, the hotel and the restaurant are both in need of uh, massive renovation. Uh, in order to be able to upgrade the facilities and improve them so that they're sustainable, it's a fairly significant capital investment. And it gets back to the very old thing that I said, we need the demographics to be able to justify and actually handle the carrying costs for someone like, uh, uh, let's just say, a significant restaurant. So uh, we would like to take the indoor pool and convert it to an outdoor pool. We've done, uh, we've, we've learned through quite a few different interviews with developers and so forth that their outside pools are substantially more popular. So we'd like to cut that building in half, basically. Still leave a small rooftop deck here and a small lap pool inside for our winter guests, but have an outdoor pool and outdoor hot tub. And hopefully that thing will be left open year round. We need six little dial houses that are currently right at the toe of the slope when you drive in and then have a, a large parking lot in front of them, we'd like to recommend or suggest that we flip that so that the parking would be actually at a slightly lower elevation and put behind the uh, style houses. It also allows us to come further to the south and then we could put seven instead of six dollars. So we gain one dollar. But still keeping that um, historical charm, if you will, of the simple cottage, which we've met with SHPO, which is the State Historical Preservation Office, and there are several uh, elements to Portage Point in that are very important from that historical preservation perspective. One of them, actually the most significant apparently, is the casino building. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Uh, all the rope rafters are snapped, it's, it's in bad shape. But apparently, the type of architecture that is and the period that it's from uh, is very rare. According to Shippo's office, they claim that every other building like that has burned down. They really want to see it restored as well as these little cottages. Significantly, and, and you know, I, there is something about when you drive up to Portage Point uh, that makes you want to burn it down. No, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> but uh, there is something unique about the feel when you drive up to the place. Um, it's the little cottages. It's that. It's the architectural style and just the historical feel that you, I think, you know, that you feel. So we want to try and figure out a way of qualifying for, for certain grants that are available uh, that would help us to, um, to be able to afford to do that type of restoration because it's a lot more expensive than just scraping and starting over. Uh, it's significantly more expensive. The, key to being able to qualify for the grants 
is that you have to do two things. One is you have to invest. You have to show us what's called staffing and investment contract has to be signed by me. Uh, so you have to show them that you're willing to put X amount of dollars into the project. And two, you have to create full-time jobs. So you have to be able to say to the community that's attracting these grant funds that you're going to create viable long-term jobs. And that is back to my opening comment that I need your help figuring out a way to make this more than a six to ten weeks. Can't hire people for six to ten weeks and seven, seven down the road. Or they have clawbacks, which means you have to pay back the money that you got the grant. So it's really, really important that we know this thing can work. So, my hook and my opinion of what it takes to build that shoulder season is the marine connection. It is what makes us unique. As I mentioned before, we don't have a downhill ski slope, we don't have a golf course, we have this unique waterfront. And in my experience, which I've been involved in the marine business since I was 16 years old, it's all I've ever done. I know boaters really well. And the thing that most people find surprising is that people who are seriously invested in their boats, uh, it's a 12-month season for them. In fact, in my experience, a lot of them spend more time um, in their boats when it's dry dock than when it's in the water. Uh, it's, I mean, I have a marina, a couple of marinas down in the Whitehall area where on a Saturday afternoon in January or November, you'll go in there and there are 10 guys acting like they're working on their boats and the game is on a big screen and they're all hanging. It's, it's an unbelievably social experience for them. And they'll bring their families up. Hopefully the kids will go ski or whatever go ice fishing, they go to the restaurants, they stay in the hotels, they rent condos, they meet with their interior designers to redo the, the inside, they, they put mechanics to work, they put people to work, and that's what you'll see on this uh, drawing over here, is uh, to the north of the main resort, most of you probably know we have a property called the ball field. And it's part of the special use permit. It, it is where you have, uh, it's been designated as boat storage and parking. It's for the overflow parking because there is not enough parking on the site to meet what's already there. So historically, you've probably seen cars pulled out in the fields and a lot of kind of random boats sitting out in the, in the back for you. Uh, my suggestion, is that this building be built down on that property and that it would serve multi, it would be a multi purpose facility. Um, as I mentioned, in my experience, if you get serious voters invested in the community and invested in their in, in, in coming to this facility, they come here in the off season. That provides income and jobs. In the, in in season, the vast majority of the building is empty, and it's ideal for attracting people to valet parking. If I say to someone, "I don't want your car here. I want to haul it down. You know, I want to leave it in a field," it's not attractive. If I tell them I'm going to get it out of the sun, put it in a protective environment, in a closed building, they love it. The boat storage buildings that I own, in the summer, people fight to park them. They love it, even if it's a ways away. So. Indoor secure parking during the summer months when the place is empty gets cars off the streets, gets them out of the parking lots. Um, the existing six dial houses that are currently at the toe of the slope that I mentioned before, I would like to move them down the street and buffer the impact of this boat farm. Our intent is to make it more of an agricultural feeling building, a little more of a barn because. That, that are already horses here, kind of a. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of an agricultural flash. You know. <laughs> so we felt it would fit better if it was more of a boat barn. 
and then we would, we would move the building back off the street and buffer the streetscape by putting those six existing dollhouses that are in pretty rough shape. We fix them up a little bit, but they could be used for uh, seasonal employment. So they would be employee housing during the summer months. Because although we want to build a year-round resort and want to offer full-time jobs, we know that during six to ten weeks, we are going to amp up. You know, we need a sustainable development that can make it through the shoulder season. But we know that we're going to be adding, uh, you know, ramping up, if you will, during the summer. So this would be some of the employee housing. We also have uh, this casino building that we talked about earlier. In the renovation plans, we intend to do a loft where we have a bunkhouse or additional employee housing and possibly a couple of empty uh, suites that exist in this building here called the Beach Lot. It could be employed out of the Oh, let's see. What else is there? <coughs> oh, this is a new building here. This amenity, the intent would be to take these uh, tennis courts that are shot and really, because of the needed space for a tennis court, they're really, they, they don't, they're not set up well here. Um, we would turn this into a parking lot that would accommodate the marine facilities, and then you would have uh, bathroom showers, laundry facilities, and then above it you'd have a um, harbor master's quarters to run the facility, and this is ideally set up so you can see the water. There are, in my opinion, there are three delicate issues. One is introducing change, such as a boat storage facility. This boat barn is obviously going to be a big contrast to the open field that you're used to seeing. I think we can buffer it. We can do plantings and soften the impact of it. Uh, but it's a change. The second issue is there are, it's the strangest thing I've never really seen in life before, but there are two dead-end roads running through the center of the project. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, anybody that knows the property well knows that there's a road called 7th Street that actually comes down out of the, the dune here and crosses. The hotel is already resting on part of it, and it runs under the hotel and, and comes out here, as well as 9th Street, where we would like to put our boat uh, ramp. And, and so my offering is that I would like to swap these two, what I consider to be pretty dysfunctional uh, road ends, for a public parking lot. So the, the private parking would begin right here. You can see my line here, this little gate. This would all be public parking and a public fish cleaning station, and we would construct a fishing platform to get people out to where there's a really good fishery. So now you'd be able to take two dead end roads, which are actually duplicated all around the lake. I'm sure you're probably aware that there are road accesses, uh, many, many of them around the perimeter of the lake. In my opinion, this is a, a very good trade off for a functional access to uh, a fishery of this. Significant. So.
and they flow at 20 gallons a minute each. So wonderful water quality, big improvements. Uh, this, the, the existing wells that it's running on are very old and shallow wells with collapsing screen, a lot of iron fungus and water issues. So the water quality issue, another what I consider to be foundational <coughs> infrastructure issue, is almost addressed. So yeah, we've got uh, hopefully some of the grants that uh, we're trying to, to obtain will address roads, uh, pedestrian safety. We're hoping we can qualify for a CAP grant and a Category A transportation grant that we could get an in, there's not a lot of room, but there's enough room for an in-lane bike path. And that would be, in my opinion, a tremendous pedestrian safety uh, improvement because the road is fairly windy, fairly narrow, and there's a lot of people on it for summer, and a lot of driving, cars going back and forth, but in my opinion, it's, it's pretty hazardous, so. I really don't want to jump into questions because we're going to get caught in, in a maelstrom that we do. <laughs> so I, what I'd like to do is have Bob wrap up, and then we'll begin the, the question um, process. Um, Bob, one thing, is, is how, how, does, how do these plants change the number of occupants, number of rooms, is there a change in, um, well, you know, the final density is kind of driven by what the final site plan approval is, but the, the proposal is to take the existing hotel and convert it slightly. Right now you've got, um, kind of a, you know, what I'll call an old-fashioned style of room where there used to be rooms that didn't even have bathrooms in them. And, and yeah, you can adjoin some of the rooms so that the thing can be expanded and contracted right now from about 29 rooms to 37 rooms. And we're suggesting that we design this so that we have 26 hotel minions, so they can be considered a condominium or a hotel minion which are two bedroom on average. A couple of them are three bedroom, a couple of them are one bedroom. But then that's, that, they're very cleverly designed so that during the in season, most people come with families and want a two bedroom condo. During the shoulder season, when you get someone for a fall color tour or something like that, they're looking for one room, a couple looking for one room. So these rooms are designed to be, to be segregated. And so the range would be from 26 hotel minions to the potential of 47 individuals. So, you know, density-wise, it's, it's, it's a slight increase, but not a lot. So similar to this here, you've got six existing um, dollhouses now, it was seven. The restaurant, uh, probably the most significant thing we want to do with the restaurant, aside from completely tear down the kitchen and so forth, is uh, terrace the exterior so that we can get some outside dining on the front side of the lawn. The French doors across the face and open up that banquet facility. The only other thing I'd ask you to comment on, because I think it probably will come up, is what are your plans for this summer? Um, well, we're working with Century 21, Suzanne Riley's been uh, a big part of our team effort to, to move this project forward. So we've uh, done some cosmetic improvements. There, we are applying for a blight grant, so we're doing things that are non-structural, non, would not in any way uh, ruin our efforts to, to qualify for a blight grant. Uh, but they are making it so that they're at least functional. So the uh, condominiums, the cottages, the cabins will be open. The uh, Jeff Sternberger is, or there he is, he's Managing really is managing the property, but he's he's primarily focused on the um, uh, as being the harbor master, running the marine side of it, as well as um, weddings, banquets. Okay, great. And we, as I mentioned, we we got our liquor license started, but we've asked to amend it to allow for water, so it's going to take a little longer. The bar will not be open. 
handle 50% of the questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, it's about 7.15, David. <laughs> this is about to say one place. So everyone knows the building is not, it's a new idea from Bob's standpoint, but the existing special use permit that Mike and Devo had had always had a, going well, back, I can't speak to the planning commission, but I remember it's on a special use permit now. It's not like never built building there. Not, I don't think as big as that, Bob, but it was on the existing special use permit, yeah. if I'm not it's approved before. It was approved years ago. So Bob's idea is a little bit different from the building, but there has been a building in there, it's just that Mr. DeVoe uh, never constructed it. Because our hope was always as a township, overflow parking, which I know you, you live out there, you're fully aware of some of those weddings they had, there was no parking. I got called out two or three times because people couldn't get up the street. On Sunday, Saturday night at 11 o'clock at night, I'd go out and ask people to move their cars in a wedding reception. I do not want to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you know, he brought this plan to show us. I think getting the people out of there and not having a part of that facility is a huge deal to fire, rescue, it's a huge safety issue for the township. Uh, and uh, I just want to compliment on that because it's a big commitment on his part, but I think it, it alleviates a ton of traffic. So. And Al, um, is it safe to say that the, these site plans will get them on a, an equity dot info? Yeah. And so people can look at them. Yeah, we have the first set on there now, and then when Bob gives me the PDFs, we'll get these on there. Okay, great. Okay, it's, uh, I've got like 720. What I'd like to do is provide no more than five minutes for the tables to identify one person and kind of a, a person that will ask your questions. But for also each one of the tables to talk about the, the two or three um, big questions, big ideas, big opportunities that you see that you'd like to talk about. So we're going to go five minutes and we're going to go around. <laughs>
which is a fairly significant vessel. And I need to figure out if there's a way of getting these vessels to fuel. If not, I am asking in my site plan to be approved to, to offer, to offer uh, provide that facility if I need it. Um, and the only way it would happen is if someone else, uh, I'll use Dennis McCarthy as an example just because I know he's a professional expert at that industry. I would only do it if someone like that wanted to provide those facilities there so that you know it's done right and it's, they, they're the experts, they know how to manage the fuel and handle it. So it would not be my operation, but, um, you know, I guess the best analogy I can give you is I don't, I, I could probably run the Boston Marathon with uh, shackles on and handcuffs, but I'd, I'd be in rough shape. Same with the, with the development, I don't want to be shackled. So if I need it, I'd like to be able to provide it, I really don't want it. <laughs> okay, table over here. We are, I <laughs> we would love to see it open. We think it'll help all the guests. If you have weddings, they have to bring their own. Or they can hire a caterer. Yeah. So they can hire a caterer. So yeah. could someone do that and set up a business? I don't have the answer. I could, get, I could research that for you, but here's what I know. Can, I, can I just clarify the question real quick? So are you talking about like for this summer while in interim before the liquor list? Yes. Okay. Well, Sorry. okay. Uh, let me just bring you, bring you up to speed on the liquor list. We approved. We, approve, we, we, approve, we, approve, we paid the fees. We own the license, but we're, expand, we're asking to expand it. So that, as an example, we can serve on watercraft, which is a, another process you have to go through. So it's not likely that I'll have it done that quickly for this summer. Very likely that I'll have it done for next summer. And so I'm open to, to whatever. If someone has the proper insurance and license and can handle that liability and get approved to do it every weekend or whatever, I guess they could. But I don't know the, the legal answer to that. Okay, this, this table over here in the corner. The bulk barn part of it. Uh, have you got a size for that building? Yes. It, uh, the, the, the footprint of that building is about 52,000 square feet. It would be 180 by 200. 180 by what? 280. And then the, the, and the back side of it is a uh, an additional like 4,000 square feet. So it's 50,000 square feet plus either two or 4,000 square feet. And that's intended to be where you have uh, parts and so forth. That would pretty much take up that whole ball field, right? No, no. I don't know if you can see this. Um, it's probably, you probably have to get a little closer to it, but the property that we own is run back here to the street. We've offset it. Uh, we moved it back into so that we have this buffer zone, as I mentioned before, where we can put these uh, the the doll houses that are up here, these six dollars are at the setback line, and then obviously we we tripled that setback to, to create the distance, uh, kind of a buffer there, and then we also own this land up here and this land over here. So this kind of strange parcel of land, but it, 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 uh, I guess I didn't realize there was a second street there coming off the end of that building. This, the one that we've got here shows Second Street, and I didn't realize it. There's, there are old roads platted, which part of our site plan review process would be to ask for the abandonment of these old platted roads. They've never been installed. Never been. Okay, we'll move to this table in the front. We have Oh. 
and that is historical renovations of vessels. Um, this area has a history of uh, boat building. Century Boat Works was down here. Um, is it called Portage Wire? Portage, yeah, is yeah. based right here. And they're known in the industry for some of the best wiring harnesses out there. And what a unique opportunity to buy old vessels, which is what I, that's really what I want to do. I'd rather, I want to drive the launch and fix old boats. <laughs> so that's that's my only interest in this project, really.
that's the key. Is we're looking for those relationships. So if someone asked what the community can do, if you're willing to help develop those relationships, uh, I'm willing to get out of the way and help be successful. Great, this table. Uh, how is the vote ramp going to be used? It's, it's not public, is it? Well, that's, that, that's one of the reasons why we're asking 9th Street to be swapped for, for a public fishing pier is because we felt that if that was just a ramp that everybody could use, it would just be mass chaos because where are trucks and trailers going to park? We're already needing to lure people into the valley parking down to that boat sort of thing. If you introduced a public <laughs> ramp, it would be chaos. So that's really the only reason why we're asking to, to, to move that dead end road down to, to the south end of the property. So, no, it would be, in fact, if you look closely, our intent would be to, uh, ah, I just thought of the third. <laughs> <laughs> People are concerned with boats being hauled down the road, right, and the impact of a boat ramp. And um, one of the things that I think is a really good fit for this solution and this additional revenue stream is that if you think about the way that operation works, it's really busy in April and a couple of weeks in May, and the last two weeks in September and the month of October. And that's the off season. I mean, it's really not that busy around here. So for vehicular traffic, pedestrian traffic, and so forth, you're not occupying and using this space. So in the summer months, our proposal is that this, this walkway, this boardwalk that runs along the shoreline, would run right across that ramp. So that that ramp can't, you know, just anybody with a boat and trailer doesn't see the ramp and go, hey, I can start heading down. So it's barricaded. The boat ramp is barricaded uh, during peak season. So it's a private ramp. It's used to haul boats down the road. Besides regulations, uh, how big the boats uh, can be Big. Huh? Big. Do you have special equipment to get them out? Yes, we do. Self propelled hydraulic drill. Okay, this table will. This one other. <laughs> for what? For cleaning boats uh, prior to. Good question. We intend to uh, get our permits under and, and, and uh, um, subscribe. Is the word I'm just looking for? Clean marine. Clean, the new Clean Marine, Michigan Clean Marine Act, which gives you a little tax credit. So you have a filter when you do pressure washing, you have no filtration systems, etc. Okay, let's take a look. Before I ask a question, can you clarify on the launch? Is that gonna, so you're not going to propose any outsource like some of the Marines down? Well, you, you might have some. But our, our goal is, if you look at these, they're fairly large slips. So those don't go to, you're really talking about rack storage. Right, exactly. Yeah, there's no, usually that's done with a negative lift force clip. You know what I'm talking about? The, the, so this would be a ramp. I'm not saying there wouldn't be people who have a, a fishing boat that they come up, they launch it, they stay for a week, and then they want to put away. But the in-out service, in the sense that you're. Like a daily, multi Yeah, no. No, because it's a ramp. Yep. In out services usually go to racks with a negative force press. I have one of those. They work really well. Um, we didn't have a lot of questions. I did have some okay. questions, though, uh, for the table. But I, I appreciate you at least coming in, vetting and having input on that. I think that's key for what you're doing. Um, I think a lot of my questions center around access. And the access points would be the road around the end. Um, uh, can, you turn this or, can you see this all right? Or, I can see that too, but uh, so that was one of them, the launch, and I can put answer. And then access to the boat farm. Uh, it sounds like it's going to become the road down. It's both the boat launch. There's, the, there's two accesses in the yep. middle. One off Portage Point Drive and one off Seaport. Um, on the plate, it looks like you're going to the white road on the end. Uh, well, if we're lucky and we're successful in getting a TAP grant and a Category A transportation grant, then the goal would be to have an in-lane bike path 
all the way from town to here. To the channel. To the channel. Yep. Yeah. So you know what I mean by inlane bike path? Basically, yeah. it's just an extra wide road. Yeah. Sort of but thing. I think mean, you touched on it because a lot of us here, I think, or some of us have property to the south. And during some of these events, yeah. you can't get a car through there. And the, right. I think the supervisor you know, touched on it. You know, he's getting told. And that was very frustrating to us, too. But I think that <coughs> would solve that issue if you had that. So. Well, and this is something that would be relevant to you then. The other thing that we're aware of is line of sight. When you drive around that building, there's a, there's a utility building that obstructs your view to see who's coming around the corner. And our intent would be, although we don't want to, it's a historical structure, you know, it's plastic. We want to fix it up. And we want to put a, design it so it's a, a porch that you can see through. So your line of sight is open. The architect section spent quite a bit of time working on uh, transportation and traffic issues. So, uh, would open up that line of sight substantially because it would move that wall back about 10 feet. And it, that way you can see around the radius that you're, that you're driving around. Next time you, you I think, you I went through this today. Yeah. It's tight. Yeah. And the building structure, you can see it coming around the corner. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got about uh, 10 or 12 minutes left in the program for tonight. Yeah, you folks have a question over here? I got a question. Bob, um, we're talking about big, big boats and the bigger boats than we've got now. That end of the lake, as you know, traditionally is a prime sailing area. There's big boat bases, there's also small boat bases, all the time. It's the best place on the lake to water ski and to tube, and boats are constantly going back and forth in there. And my question is what steps can you take to mitigate the amount of weight that's going to be created by the big boats coming and going from the channel and back and, and, and also min minimize the interference with the traditional uses of that part. Right. Absolutely. My commission is currently exploring the ordinance which has been supported by the charter operators and a number of people to establish a shoreline protection no weight zone 300 feet from shorelines and structures throughout the lake. And we will be pursuing that and hopefully have it in place in the most time. We did something with public input. So I'm in favor of that. And also my general comment would be that uh, most of the vessels that would be cruising vessels that we're trying to track, in my experience, when I set up a cruise, I'm literally idling all through there, but just programming, setting your GPS, whatever you're doing. So when you come in that channel, the distance is not very far. You're pretty much just titled down. I, I can't stop Rodney Dangerfield from, you know, going crazy. But for the most part, this type of vessel is going to be um, in either breakdown mode or gear, you know, they're gearing up or they're breaking down. They're, they're putzing into their slip, they're done. They, they're, they're traveling for the most part. Thank you. Can I ask you another question regarding that? Um, it, it appears as though there are maybe three boats that are creating that issue that are actually tenants of yours. And I'm um, just wondering why repairing owners would be penalized potentially by that um, ordinance on that. Yeah, I know that's not your issue, but I guess that's a concern. Well, if, if you've got a problem with something that's in our facility, call Jeff. <laughs> <laughs>
in my view. I think one of the big differences this year and moving forward that you've never seen the Portage Point in is there really is a harbor master there who is literally spending all his time controlling and watching and taking care of the marina. Where before, nobody really was out there monitoring things. And so, you're speaking of yourself. Yes. Dave Jeff makes a really good point. That is the marine connection. In fact, really the connection to the waterfront for Forge Point Inn has been uh, non-existent. And it, those those slips were initially put in, and there was never it was never turned into a marina. It was just there, there were it's like a parking lot of boats. People come and go on their own. There's no tenants. There's nobody monitoring, helping to control the facility. And with the harbor master there, it's a whole new ball game. When you're coming in, it's a windy day. You got line. You got to call. Someone's out there to catch a line. They're also there to say, "Hey, man, go go flying down the lake." And you just about ran a kid over. That's, that's you know, we're, we can't control people, but we can at least be there to try and mitigate. Okay, we've got um, we've got only about six or seven minutes left. Dave, do you have a follow up on that? Uh, yeah, it has to do with the marina. I'm concerned with that pier in the middle. Can you talk more about that? And um, it looks awfully long to me, quite frankly. And I know it takes Corps of Engineers and DNR permits and all kinds of things. Does it encroach onto the deep water area where there is presently fishing? Well. I mean, it's all pretty deep water area. There's a very significant coastal shelf there. But, um, A, I believe that it's within the allowable pure length. B, I think that it actually is a really uh, good idea for vessel traffic control. It tends to, when people see that pier head, they tend to slow down, they tend to be more cautious. And this is ingress and egress for the whole operation. So um, it's not so far out that it's going to restrict the function of the harbor. You know, this, the, the lake there is wide, it's big, and it's deep. And I actually think that you'll see what we design this to be is access for people to get on and off water taxis or launches and a viewing platform. So in my opinion, what a great opportunity for People with diesel, even if they're wheelchair bound, they can get out there and they feel like they're in a sailing regatta. If you've got regattas going through there, they're going to be 50 feet away from them at times when they pass through, 100 feet away from them. They can really engage. And I think you'll see, I mean, people go out to the end of the pier on Lake Michigan all the time. Why do they go out there? <laughs> That's <laughs> absolutely. I'll be, I'll be pushing the cart. But that's what we're working on. You know, no joking. That's exactly what we're asking our legal license to allow us to do. We don't have a license now. So hopefully, we will. Okay, we've got about uh, five minutes left tonight. I want to say one thing. I'm going to take another question. Um, Bob, throughout this whole process, which has been over two years, I think, um, it has been one of the more accessible people that we've ever worked with. And, um, you know, I, I think if you. If you've got a great idea, if you've got a question, Bob is pretty easy to reach. But I also want to again say that all the questions that you have written down, you said you had four here, make sure that we get those before you leave, and we will answer those, as well as other follow-up questions that you may have. So I just want to reiterate that. Um, but let's take another question from this. One more question was asked that you removed the tennis courts. Are, are you thinking of putting them back in? Well, or pickleball? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a bad idea. That's, that's my point. It's, uh, it's good for older people. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's good for older people. Um, you know, we have this extra land down here. And one of the designs we did anticipate we could put a test for or pickleball or something like that. You have the land for it, uh, and it's a good way of hopefully drawing some people and some cars down to the indoor. Is pickleball in the recreation plan? Yes. It is, right? Is it what? In the recreation plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, it's no, it's really a. Oh, 
Okay, question, our last question will come from this table right here. Do you have another question? No. Okay, the question is from the table Al is asked. Is there going to be any show from the bolt barn to the inn and back? Yes. Yeah, and or valet, probably. Would the shuttle extend to Arcadia Bluffs, the Heathland? <laughs> 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 That's exactly what we, you know, we've talked about that before. We're hoping that the Manistee uh, transit We've also had some interesting, some very preliminary discussions with Benzie Buzz, kind of coming from the other direction. So. Okay, that is the last. We're going to stick to our guns here on timing. Um, you have been great, and thank you so much for your time. Um, Yeah. 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 Yeah.